Hello, this is Chris Warren. I'm one of the senior sales engineers here at Datto, and today we're going to be going over initial pairing, setup, and configuration of environments that you're looking to back up to your Datto device. You can see I'm actually interfacing with a Datto device here on premise through its local IP address up here in my address bar, and then this page here reflects some of those preparatory steps you need to go through when doing the initial pairing. So first and foremost, you download agent-based software. This is available for Windows 2000 and newer, Linux, and Macintosh. It needs to be installed in each one of these environments just so it can properly communicate with the data device in terms of when the next scheduled backup is and what's changed since the last backup. We do also offer an agentless solution. In order to implement that, you need to have licensed VMware, so some of the niceties of that is that you're tapping directly into your hypervisor, selecting which VMs it is you'd like to back up, and the VMs can technically be off, and we can still back it up because we are querying vSphere for those block level changes. Also, we will carry over the VMX file. Uh, that's a file that's associated uh, in terms of the resources that you had allotted for the particular virtual environment. So when you are ready to do a restore, you can carry over those existing settings in one fell swoop. Going back to the add a new agent, I'm actually just under the legacy add agent just to kind of go through these initial steps. Under here, encrypt, you do have the ability to encrypt data that's stored locally on the data device. Keep in mind, by default, we're already encrypting everything that moves in transit and lays at rest in our data center using AES 256-bit encryption. We're also SSAE16 certified. Here under ads is where you're going to put in the IP address of that agent you're looking to pair. So if you're on the server or workstation you're looking to back up, just click use my IP, it pulls it in automatically. Otherwise, you can manually type in an IP address or a host name, and once we recognize it, the protect button lights up green. You'll press it. It'll go through like a 15, 20 second pairing sequence. Once complete, automatically redirects you to this protect tab, and you'd see it listed amongst any other agents that you might have previously paired. Everything on this page is identifiable by a host name and corresponding IP address. Now we do have another method of pairing agent-based software systems, and that's right under here, under agent-based systems. And really the differential here between this and the legacy ad agent is that this wizard gives you the ability to enter multiple IP addresses at once, so you can do a massive pairing in one swoop. Now let's go back into the Protect tab and we will go into Configure Agent Settings for one of these environments, CWARN, which is my local desktop here at Datto. Configure agent settings, everyone has their own configure agent settings, and you'll see there's an apply button for each one of these settings. The blue apply button just allows you to apply that one setting for that particular environment that you're backing up. Clicking apply to all gives you the ability to streamline that setting across the board to all paired agents. So for example, if I wanted to add an extra hour of backups to all my environments that I'm currently backing up, I would just click apply to all to streamline and save myself some time. First and foremost, so let's look at local backup and retention policy. You're going to choose the intervals as to when you're going to perform your backups. Uh, for the most part, most people will do hourly backups, hourly intervals. You can go all the way down to five-minute intervals if you'd like. It's definitely overkill for me and most folk, but you know, if your society deems it necessary, you do have that option. Another reason why you might do a tighter intervals is if you have a large database that's having massive data set changes occurring throughout the day. Just so you understand that the way our backups are performed with the inverse chain technology, we're only recording block level changes after that initial base. But if you do more than a 15% data set change since the last backup, we will redo the entire base. So that would be one scenario uh, outside of security one uh, where you might want to tighten up your intervals to kind of make yourself less susceptible to having to redo that entire base. Here under custom settings, it brings up a grid as to when you're going to perform those hourly backups. It's a typical business model for me, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's when I can perform my hourly backups. You can add and remove as many hours and days of the week as you'd like simply by checking or unchecking anything within the grid here. Down here for cloud backup retention policy, it's the same concept as above, but how often do I want to replicate out to the cloud? I'm going to do it once a day like most masses, but you can do it as often as you'd like as you can see in here. Even custom scheduling if you want to do particular hours and days of the week. I always recommend to do it at the end of the day for a couple of reasons. A, you're not competing with company bandwidth during business hours, and B, in the event that a disaster does occur overnight, at least you know all those proprietary data set changes that have occurred from that previous day have been replicated out to our data center so you can pick up right where you left off from the cloud in the event something does occur. You have full control of retention settings locally on the data device and up in the cloud. 
So for local retention, you can see here you have intradailies to dailies, dailies to weeklies, and weeklies to monthlies. Look at these three settings as consolidation tools. So for example, intradailies to dailies, you're really just saying, at what point in time do I want to start consolidating these hourly backups I'm doing up here into one backup so I don't have piles and piles of hourlies? I make it reflective to my work week. After five days, let's start consolidating those hourlies into one. Same holds true going forward, dailies to weeklies and weeklies to monthly. The one differential up here, the pruning tool. Once the consolidated backups reach a certain age, when do I want to wipe them completely free from the local device? And we preach your data, you know, after a couple months at a site, at a mine, most importantly at a production, probably a good chance you're not going to revert back to those old data sets. So you might as well start freeing up some space. You can keep information locally as long as you like. It really comes down to the policy of the end user that you're working with and how much they're willing to pay for space. Down here for cloud retention and backup. So it's the same concept as above, but I'm up at the data center now. A lot of the same consolidation settings for me, but the one thing I'm always going to change is that pruning tool. Since I'm only keeping information locally for a couple of months, I probably want to keep it up in the cloud a little bit longer, just in case there is that chance I do need to revert back to it for whatever reason. So you really can just equate the local backup retentions to your wallet and the backup retention in the cloud, that's your bank. Scrolling down further, you have volume level backup control, and this is where you choose which volumes you do or do not want to include as part of your backups. So just so you understand how it works, when you first pair an agent or an environment that you're looking to backup, anything that we recognize as a logical volume, we're going to backup by default. So if there was a D drive, for example, that I did not want to backup, I would need to come in here and exclude that volume. Now on the flip side of the coin going forward, let's say that you've already paired an agent or an environment that you're backing up. and You've added a new logical volume that you would like to back up as well to it, like an E drive or an F drive. I would need to come in here, click refresh drives so that we recognize it, and then uncheck the exclude volume checkbox because by default it will be excluded. Down here under verification, you're just choosing as to when you want the screenshot verifications to occur. Also, how much additional wait time you need uh, after the boot up of that virtual environment. I always recommend doing at least five minutes because you want to make sure you get up to that control off the lead screen before we take a screen grab. Taking a screen grab of the Windows logo going around in circles doesn't really do much for you. Down here for error threshold, this is measured in increments of hours. So basically saying how much time goes by before we alert you that we were unable to take a screen grab for any reason. So you want to keep in mind two scenarios here when figuring out this number. A, a 24-hour cycle for an entire day of backups and screenshot verifications to run through a cycle. And then also the days that you're not performing your backups. So when I'm doing a 24-hour cycle and also adding into the fact that I'm not doing backups on Saturday or Sunday, I think the number would be something higher than 72. So that's 72 hours, that equals three days. So I'm going to put something like 75, which just seems like a nice round number. Now in here, you also have the ability to put the email addresses as to where you want these screen grabs set to. The person that you deem the initial overseer during that initial pairing, you'll see in here, and you can add as many emails as you like to separating by comma. You might have a stakeholder that wants to see the screenshot verification. Now you'll notice there's two lists here. This first list here is saying that, okay, you're going to receive screen grabs for the good and the bad assuming this checkbox is not checked. Once I check this checkbox, it's just like it sounds, send successful screenshots to a different email list. So the way that I actually have it set up here is this email address is only gonna receive the bad screenshots because I have this checkbox here uh, checked and then there's empty spots right here in the secondary list. So this might be an area where I wanna send put a stakeholders, like somebody that uh, wants that, that's an end user, um, you wanna make sure you send them some nice screenshots without un, uh, opening an unnecessary can of worms. So this top one receives the bad, this bottom one receives the good. Now down here, just a bunch of different types of reporting and alerting mechanisms. So you can see here, once again, my email address is under the critical error alerts. It probably should be in the warning notices as well. So in the event that, say, something like crypto lock or ransomware is detected, that's where these warning notices come into play, and you want to make sure someone's alerted to that. So again, adding as many emails as you like to separating by comma. And this concludes uh, anything that you should know, at least for best practices, when setting up and pairing and configuring any environments that you're looking to back up. For more information on how to run anywhere, restore any time, or protect anything, go to data.com.